we'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We are continuing in our new study of the book of Exodus, and we are ready for Exodus chapter 3 tonight. So I want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 3. We'll be back there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you've joined us tonight. If you have any questions or concerns about tonight's class, if there's anything we can do to help, if there's something that we need to be praying about, either personally or as a congregation, uh, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can call or text us at 608-224-0274. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can visit the website at fourlakeschurch.org. Use the contact information there, and we'll put all that information on the screen in just a moment. It'll stay there throughout our study tonight. And you can also find us on social media by searching some of the big ones for Four Lakes Church. And we also want to invite you to, subs to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications and to be reminded whenever we go live or add something new to that channel. As I said, we are continuing in our study of the book of Exodus. So like the book of Genesis, Exodus was also written by the prophet Moses. And in the first two chapters of Exodus, a number of years have passed since the end of Genesis. A new Pharaoh steps on the scene, a man who really does not appreciate what Joseph had done for the nation. And this new Pharaoh is pretty nervous. The Israelites are multiplying rapidly. He's pretty scared that they may... Uh, team up with their enemies and maybe overcome the nation, but it seems that he's even more concerned with the possibility of them just getting up and leaving because they've come to rely upon their labor uh, as their workforce, uh, doing a lot of building of cities and so on. And so Pharaoh then, uh, based on these fears, he appoints uh, many taskmasters over the Israelites, basically enslaving them uh, making their lives difficult, preventing them from leaving. And we also found uh, a week or so ago in the first couple chapters here that Pharaoh orders the killing of all of the male babies just as they are born. He talks to the Hebrew midwives about that. They refuse to obey. They're more scared of God than they are of him. And then he just gives that as a general command to all of the nation of Egypt. Any newborn male Israelite is to be thrown into the Nile River and drowned. Of course, one family... Uh, covers a basket with pitch, uh, launches their son out among the reeds in the Nile River where the child is found by Pharaoh's daughter. And thanks to uh, the older sister, uh, this child is then raised in Pharaoh's household. Of course, this is Moses. And around the age of 40, we fast forwarded four decades, he sees one of his countrymen being abused. So he's out there scoping things out, looking around at how things are going and he sees this abuse of power, and Moses strikes and kills the Egyptian taskmaster. He looks both ways before he does it. We talked about what that really meant. And then once this man is dead, he hides his body in the sand. Well, word gets out. Uh, Moses flees over to the land of Midian, where he helps some shepherd women, and is given one of those women as a wife, as a reward for doing that, I suppose. And that's pretty much where we left it last week. So at roughly the age of 40... Uh, Moses is tending his sheep in the middle of nowhere, somewhere out there in the land of Midian. So let's continue tonight with uh, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, the first paragraph. Exodus chapter 3, let's look at verses 1 through 6. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. At the beginning of this chapter, I hope we notice that when God decides to call somebody to get something important done, he calls on those who are busy, doesn't he? In other words, Moses wasn't just sitting around doing nothing. He wasn't moping around sad that he couldn't be back in Egypt with his people. 
But we notice that even in exile, even when he's basically on the run, Moses jumped right in to get some things done, didn't he? He was not one to sit around doing nothing. He flees from Egypt. He heads over to Midian, where he immediately helps out those shepherd women and protects them from getting harassed by the shepherds. And then he quickly becomes a shepherd himself. Now, I don't know whether you remember this, <clears throat> but back in Egypt, when Jacob and his sons moved down to Egypt from Canaan, do you remember that Joseph told them to tell Pharaoh that they were shepherds? And do you remember the reason for that? The reason was shepherds were loathsome to the Egyptians. And so I suppose if you want to be left alone to go mind your own business, you just tell them you're shepherds. And so I just find it interesting that Moses, raised in Pharaoh's household, as soon as he flees, he decides to go be a shepherd. And I don't know if this was part of his plan for hiding. They'll never find me here. They don't have anything to do with shepherds. Or if this was just far away from home or, or whatever the case may be. Um, in a sense, he's almost rebelling against his upbringing, if we want to look at it in that way. Or as we noted last week from Hebrews chapter 11, uh, Moses made a decision, didn't he? He decided to give up the passing pleasures of sin and instead decided to endure ill treatment with the people of God. So maybe he's identifying with the struggles of his people back in Egypt here. Uh, but my point here at the beginning is that Moses isn't lazy. By no means is this man a slacker. Moses is incredibly busy. And I just want to make the point here that when God goes looking for somebody to get something done, he often starts with those who are busy. And so if you think that you're busy, and if the elders of the congregation call upon you to jump in on something, don't let your busyness hold you back. But at least consider that Moses was also busy. And so your full schedule may just indicate that you are willing and able to get things done because God can use busy people. And I think I would take that away as a practical lesson from the first part of this chapter. Well, as Moses is shepherding his father-in-law's flocks, notice he takes them over to Horeb, the mountain of God, or Mount Horeb, as we like to say here in south-central Wisconsin. Of course, we have our own uh, Mount Horeb here in these parts, but uh, obviously this is not the Mount Horeb right down the road from Madison to the west side of Madison. Uh, but instead, this is the place that's also known as Mount Sinai, I believe, if I've understood all this correctly. And I believe that Horeb, the word itself, is a reference to glowing or heat, which is interesting concerning what's going to happen later and what happens in this chapter. Uh, but it's um, once he's out there, an angel, this messenger from God, appears to him in this blazing fire from a bush. It's burning, but it's not being consumed. This is very strange. And, of course, Moses was very familiar with having campfires in the middle of nowhere, and you burn up your fuel sources, and then it's gone. you got to go get more. And so here he sees this bush that's on fire but not going anywhere, and this is kind of a cool thing. And so he checks it out, and when he does, God calls him by name. And Moses responds, here I am. And God has him take off his sandals. He explains that he's standing on holy ground. And Moses is absolutely terrified. And so if, if God's point here was to get Moses' attention, mission accomplished. God does exactly what he planned on doing. And Moses at this point is just completely focused on God speaking to him from this bush. And I also want us to notice in this paragraph how God identifies himself. He is the God of your father, and then he's also the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this isn't some Egyptian God. This isn't some fake deity whose name is scribbled on the pyramid somewhere with a made-up statue out of gold or carved out of a dead tree. This is the one true living only God, the God of his ancestors. And God will often identify himself in this way throughout scripture. And to me, that really emphasizes how important it is to study the book of Genesis. Imagine if we didn't have the book of Genesis. Imagine the Bible starts with Exodus and God steps on the scene and says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. We'd have no idea what he was talking about. So it's just very important that we study Genesis from time to time. And it also, it's like a mini history lesson. If you think of God as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, multiple chapters in Genesis come to mind. All the history that's tied to those three main characters from the book of Genesis. So um, God then gets Moses' attention, tells him who he is. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, in the next paragraph. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7, 8, and 9. 
The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So not only does God identify himself, but now to, notice now he also explains that he's seen what's been happening to his people down in Egypt. And I think we can certainly imagine that this was on Moses' mind almost continually. If you could picture Moses with me out there in the middle of nowhere for several decades, tending sheep, minding his own business, I'm thinking he's thinking about his uh, brothers and sisters being terribly abused back in Egypt, wondering how it's going, wishing for a report, wishing that there was something that he could do about it. So what a feeling of helplessness. And so God then steps in and he explains, I've seen this. God knows what's happening. God is aware of their sufferings. And notice not only is God aware, but now he's ready to actually do something about it. He's about to deliver them from the cruelty of the Egyptians. He's about to bring them back into the promised land. But even with this statement of hope, I, I hope we also notice that there will be some challenges ahead. They are headed to the promised land, but I just find it fascinating that he points out that it's a place where a whole bunch of other people are now living. And so I just find it interesting. God doesn't just tell Moses the place where they are going, but he tells him about the people who are now living in the place where they are about to go. So I think that uh, we would maybe describe that as a foreshadowing. He's giving a hint as to something that's, that's coming in the future. A future difficulty is on the horizon. Well, what we need to know from this passage, though, is that God has seen the oppression that his people are going through. And so I would ask, as we try to apply this to our lives today, does God see our oppression today? Because does God see it when we oppress other people today? Does God see what we're going through? Does God see what's being done to us? Does God see what we're doing to others? Absolutely he does. God uh, pays attention. And it may not seem like he's paying attention, but uh, ultimately in the end, um, I think we'll be proven that God indeed does pay attention. So let's continue then with uh, the plan, with God's assignment that he has in mind for Moses. This is Exodus chapter 3. Verses 10, 11, and 12. Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Well, this is where it gets real, doesn't it? Uh, this is the so what section of this message. This is what it really means for Moses. So yes, the Lord is great. He's the God of my fathers. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He sees what's going on down there in Egypt. It's great that you're aware, Lord. I mean, it's great you're planning on delivering your people from that oppression down there. But wait just a minute. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about here? And uh, God's plan then is to use Moses to do this. And so God's plan is to send Moses back to Pharaoh with the mission of bringing God's people out of Egypt. Uh, if you may remember from our study a week or two ago, the name Moses. Remember what it means? It means drawn out. Because Moses was drawn out of the Nile River. Well, now, of course, Moses is being assigned this task of drawing God's people out of Egypt. At least this is God's assignment for Moses. He hasn't quite accepted it yet. He's a little bit overwhelmed by it. And so his first reaction to this is to object. Well, who am I? Um, you know, who am I to do something like this? He doesn't feel that he's qualified. What makes me qualified? Why, why did you pick me for this? And we'll get to this as we move through the next few chapters. Moses doesn't know it yet. And Moses doesn't realize this yet, but Moses is perfectly qualified to do this, isn't he? God knew exactly what he was doing. He's an Israelite. He's been raised and highly educated in Pharaoh's own house. He knows this Pharaoh better than just about anybody does. He's a man with a history of righteous anger, isn't he? Getting upset 
the beating of the Hebrew slave, at the abuse of the uh, women out there at the well with the sheep in, in the land of Midian. Um, he comes from a, a solid, godly family. He's at least somewhat known by the Israelites themselves. And now he's had 40 years of experience as a shepherd. He's been leading sheep in the wilderness, preparing him perfectly for leading God's people in the wilderness. Uh, by the way, um, let's keep on our toes. We never know what God may ask us to do at the age of 80, okay? First 40 years raised in Pharaoh's household, the next 40 years uh, working among the sheep out in Midian, and the next 40 years he's leading God's people through the wilderness. That is starting at the age of 80. I don't think we have the timeline nailed down right here, but that's where we're headed. We'll get that from other passages in the future. So I think a lot of us would consider him to be kind of an old guy at this point, and yet God picks him for this mission. Um, so one lesson from this, or another lesson is, uh, sometimes other people can see that we may be ready to serve in some way, even if we can't see it ourselves. Does that make sense? Moses didn't see himself as being qualified. God did. God saw something in Moses that Moses really didn't see in his own experience or his own life. And so if an elder puts his hand on your shoulder and suggests you may be up for something, and if you're <laughs> having that urge to say no immediately, I would just ask, resist that urge a little bit. You know, don't say no right away. You know, say no later if you have to, but uh, give it some thought and let that sink in a little bit and kind of think about Moses and what God was asking him to do. He felt overwhelmed. He felt like he wasn't qualified, but God could see something in his life. Um, uh, that uh, indicated that he was truly qualified. Um, the other side of this is sometimes those who think that they're qualified or think that they're ready for something may not really be ready. So this goes, I guess, the other way as well. And I certainly don't want to discourage anybody from jumping in on some project or some mission. Uh, but I remember my dad saying many years ago that if somebody's out there campaigning to be an elder, that may not be the guy you're looking for. And he made that statement after many years of experience, and I appreciate the wisdom in that. If somebody's out there saying, elect me, elect me, choose me, I can do it, uh, be very careful with that. And I know this came up in the discussion about elders desiring the office. Uh, over in 1 Timothy 3, as Paul writes to the young preacher Timothy, he says, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. <clears throat> An overseer, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, and so on from there. Well, some have said that aspiring to the office, or desiring the office, as some translations have it, is the first qualification for being an elder. And so if someone doesn't desire the office, then he's obviously not qualified, and he's off the hook. You don't have to worry about any of the others, because if he doesn't meet the first one, he's out. Well, um, I think we need to realize that the word must in 1 Timothy 3 comes after the statement about desiring the office. In other words, if you'd really like to be an elder, great. Now an elder must be this, this, and this to be qualified. And I'm just pointing out desiring the office is not technically one of those qualifications. Of course, we can't really appoint people against their will, can we? <laughs> We can't take them by force and make them to serve in that role. We can't draft people against their will into the eldership. Uh, but I'm just saying that if somebody doesn't desire the office, well, maybe they should. And uh, maybe they need to consider it. Maybe they need to start heading in that direction, even if it makes them uncomfortable. And I think we understand someone may be motivated in different ways into becoming an elder. I mean, some motivations are bad. If I'm looking for power or control, if I want to boss people around, for example, that's not a good reason to be an elder. Uh, but there are other motivations that are good, and they may be mixed. There may be a blend of these. If I see a need, um, if I want to serve God in a deeper capacity, and so on. There are some uh, various good reasons for wanting that. I'm just suggesting that the situation with Moses here may weigh into this discussion. Uh, Moses certainly did not desire the office that God had in mind for him. This was nothing he uh, sought out. It's nothing he asked God to uh, have the privilege of doing. In fact, as we'll see over the next few chapters, Moses actually argues with God and does everything in his power to get out of it. Uh, but ultimately, Moses gets on board with God's plan and he serves quite well 
over the next 40 years. Uh, nevertheless, after that little detour here, uh, Moses objects, and God's first response is reassurance, isn't it? Basically, this will happen. And you will know that you were able to do this with my help when you worship right back here at this very spot on this mountain when you have all the people with you. And that'll be the sign that I have caused this to happen, that I have been with you through this. And for a moment, I kind of wondered, why would God make this prediction that would be fulfilled after the fact? It's kind of a strange. You will know that I have been with you when you come back here to worship on this mountain. Well, how is that encouraging? And I kind of struggled with that just a, a little bit, but I think we realized that when Moses gets the people to Mount Sinai, they're just getting started, aren't they? He's going to need that encouragement right at that moment. Of course, they're going to end up crossing the Red Sea, fleeing the Egyptians, coming over here to this mountain. A lot's going to happen at that mountain that's been pretty discouraging or will be discouraging in the future here. So uh, God is making this promise with its obvious fulfillment, I think, as kind of a stepping stone to give Moses some encouragement along the way. So this is uh, the affirmation that God is with him. And uh, we'll get back to this in a few chapters. So let's continue tonight with the next paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Exodus 3, 13 through 17. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. In that previous paragraph, Moses objected by asking, Who am I? What makes me qualified to do such a thing? Well, now in this paragraph, Moses is basically saying, Well, who are you? So we've covered who I am. Now, Lord, who are you? And I think as he's kind of mulling this over, as he's thinking about this as a leader, he's anticipating objections, isn't he? So he's imagining traveling back to Egypt, showing up and saying, hey, everybody, let's go. And I, I think he's anticipating that they're going to have an issue with that. It's going to take more than that. They're going to have to know something about not only him, but they're also going to need to know something about God. And I'm impressed that Moses doesn't anticipate the biggest issue as being with the Pharaoh. Did you catch that? You know, what am I going to say to Pharaoh? No, that's not his first concern. <laughs> his first concern is with the people with his own brothers and sisters, uh, the Israelites. And so, um, and he's right on there, isn't he? I mean, that's exactly going to be the problem, not only in the near future, but really over the next 40 years, is getting the people on board. You can handle Pharaoh. You can't handle God's own people sometimes. That's the issue. And uh, Moses has already dealt with this 40 years earlier, hasn't he? Uh, when he killed the Egyptian, the problem wasn't in overpowering the Egyptian. He can take an Egyptian the problem was the complication with his own people who refused to follow where he was leading. And remember back then, a fellow Israelite apparently went around talking about what had just happened. And when Moses came back the next day, they turned on Moses instead of turning on the Egyptians. So he's anticipating this. So Moses wants to know, well, when they want to know who, who sent me, who's telling me to do all this, what, what do I say? Um, what is your name? That seems like a good place to start. And God answers by saying, I am who I am. Well, that's a, that's a pretty deep answer, isn't it? And I, I think Moses is uh, starting to get the idea here that God is on a completely different level than he is, isn't he? Who is God? He is the one who exists. He is the I am. He simply is. And he continues with the reference to him being the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I think the emphasis here is on God's name. Uh, in Hebrew, they refer to this, I believe, as the Tetragrammaton. It's uh, the name of God containing four consonants and no vowels. 
And in most of our English translations, the translators handle this with Lord, L-O-R-D in all capital letters. So when we see this, this isn't Lord as in master. If it's a Lord in lowercase or with the first letter capitalized and the, the rest lowercase, that's a reference to Lord as in master. If it's all caps Lord, that's the Y-H-W-H, sometimes translated over in English as Yahweh. Or uh, some of the older translations do that as Jehovah, which I don't think is a very accurate translation. But at least we know something of the word behind it. I would encourage you to turn back to the principles of translation in the front of your Bible and read that. Like the note from the translators. What did they have in mind? What were, we, what were they thinking? What was their goal in making this translation? And, and pay attention to how they deal with that, with the Lord. And most modern translations will give some explanation because it's pretty important. Uh, beyond this, the, uh, God wants the people to know, just as he's already told Moses, that he's concerned uh, about them. He's seen their oppression. He'll bring them out uh, from Egypt into the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey, and also a land that already has some people living in it. So again, we have a preview that this may not be all easy. Uh, by the way, in verse 16, we have the first reference to the elders of Israel anywhere in the Bible. Uh, between Joseph and Moses, the older men seemed to take on some sense of leadership among the people. Of course, when Joseph was out of the picture, there was kind of this leadership vacuum, and then Moses pops on the picture, and he's it again. But in between, it seems to be when the people would kind of gather around, get some advice from the old guy. So the elders of Israel, that's the first reference right here in this passage. So when Moses heads back down to Egypt, he's not to start with some kind of general announcement, hey, everybody follow me. Uh, but God says he is to take this message specifically to the elders of Israel. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph in chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Exodus chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. They will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Starting in verse 18, God goes back to addressing Moses. And he encourages Moses by telling him that the people will listen this time to what he has to say. And he won't be alone in this. I think this is also comforting. That would be comforting to me. Uh, Moses is saying that, uh, or God is saying that Moses will approach Pharaoh not on his own, but with the elders of Israel. And there is certainly a comfort in that when things happen in the congregation. Uh, what a blessing it has been to be able to uh, have elders that, uh, that I can go to for advice. And uh, that seems to be the, the situation here. And together, Moses and the elders will ask Pharaoh to let them travel three days out into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord. He won't allow it unless he's forced to allow it. And so God promises right here that he's going to strike Egypt with a series of devastating signs or miracles, and that only then will Pharaoh allow them to leave. At the end of this chapter, though, notice God explains that they will not be leaving empty-handed, will they? But instead, they are to uh, ask their neighbors in Egypt for articles of silver and gold and clothing, and they are to leave Egypt loaded down with these precious metals. And in this way, they are to plunder the Egyptians. As I see it, God is arranging them to be paid for their many years of slavery. Of course, we know that they will use much of this to build a golden calf. Oh, that's pretty unfortunate, isn't it? God blesses them with all this stuff, and they use that exact same stuff to go build a golden calf. Uh, not too long after this. But we're, we're not there yet. We're heading in that direction. Because later, they're also going to use some of this to build a tabernacle. And they didn't have gold and silver as slaves, so God had to arrange that, and that's one way that he does this. Um, uh, by the way, the King James, maybe some of the older ones, have God telling them to uh, borrow these things from their neighbors. <laughs> that is not the most accurate translation. 
Um, I think most of the more accurate, more modern translations have God telling the people to ask for these items. Um, can I please have your gold? Oh, why, yes, you may. Uh, here, would you like a sack to put that gold in? And yeah, that's the way I see it going down. God would give them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians. Um, the Egyptians would feel sorry for them, basically. Uh, as a nation, the average um, Egyptian family would look at the Israelites and say, man, what's happened to you is messed up. That's not good. Of course, it was Pharaoh who was being the pain here. And so at least the average Egyptian would feel sorry for them. Looks like God arranges this in some way. And so on the way out the door, they are to ask for the gold, silver, and fine clothing. And the people would simply hand it over. And uh, just an amazing thing. And then they leave. And I should also point out that God tells his own people to do the same thing for others as part of his law that would be delivered to Moses shortly after this. Uh, over in Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 15, this is what God says. This is a part of the old law. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years. But in the seventh year you shall set him free. When you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. I just hope we realize that God is telling his people to do for others what the Egyptian people were about to do for them as arranged by the Lord himself. So, in future years, when they let slaves go, they were to load them down with goods. They were not to send them away empty-handed. That's amazing how God, um, I don't know, didn't invent slavery, but he, he regulated it. You know, due to the hardness of their hearts, he allowed some things to continue on, uh, but he regulated it in a way that would protect those on the other end of it. So this is the plan, as was delivered by God to Moses. And this brings us to the end of Exodus 3. As we think back over what we've read tonight, I would suggest that Moses has learned a few things through this event. Wouldn't you agree with that? This was educational. This was eye-opening. Imagine being Moses. Um, as I understand it, God hasn't really communicated to Moses up to this point that we know of. I mean, I think the burning bush might have been the first contact with Moses unless I've missed something. So imagine, he's 80 years old. And God comes and speaks to him for the very first time. And, and he learned some things here. Uh, he learned, first of all, that God's holy. God is different. God is separate. Uh, and we've got that command for Moses to take off his shoes. It's not that the dirt was literally holy. The, the whole place was holy because God was in that place. And uh, that's an important lesson for Moses to learn. Uh, the other thing that Moses learns in this chapter is that God keeps his promises. And just identifying himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that right there is a reminder that God keeps his promises. God has kept his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm your God. I'm your father's God. I'll keep my promises that I make to you. Um, the other thing I think we learned from this whole chapter is that Moses learns that God sees. Of course God sees. We know that. We've got the Bible. But Moses might have been wondering. I've heard about this God, but why doesn't he fix this problem? And he's lived 80 years of his life like this, ripped away from his family, you know, raised in a, a foreign king's uh, palace, just all kinds of, just a messed up situation. And does God care? Does God see what I'm going through? Yes, he does. That's something Moses learned uh, in this chapter. And, uh, and God empathizes. He sees in a way that he'll step in and do something about it. And I think that's what God has in common with Moses. Moses has also done the same thing. And so Moses sees uh, that. And then Moses has also learned that God is with us, even in the wilderness, way out there in Midian, in the middle of nowhere, out there by a mountain with his sheep, days perhaps travel away from civilization. God was out there. God was with Moses. And God was promising to be with Moses in the future. And this, of course, I think points to Jesus, who is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. That's one of his names. And uh, I know we think about Moses as a great leader, and he was, but uh, he was prepared. And God had to coax him into it, encouraging him along the way. God was with him through that process. And with that, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you this coming Lord's Day morning, 9.30, as we get back. I think we're wrapping up our study of Obadiah. 
So we spent three weeks, or we will have spent three weeks, on the first one-chapter book in the Bible. And, uh, and then in worship, we plan on jumping back into Hebrews with a study of the first part of Hebrews chapter 10. That's at 1030. Uh, concerning our study of Exodus, we need to take a break for a few weeks. I hate to tell you that. I uh, kind of need to hit pause on Exodus. Uh, next week, I'll be working at our youth camp up near Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And uh, so I'll be in the North Woods a week from tonight. And then the day after I get back from camp, I plan on heading toward Ohio to see my in-laws on our way out to visit Donald and Lynn out in North Carolina for a week or two. So uh, in this class, I'll be passing along the next few videos from World Video Bible School. I'll send out a link by email, try to put that on Facebook as well. And uh, I think we're heading towards several more lessons on Bible geography and archaeology. John Moore has done a great job with these. There's a value to having the unique perspective of those who've traveled in that part of the world, those who have actually done some digging over there, because that's something I've not done. And these guys have some, some good information that needs to be shared. So I'm, I'm thankful for these little breaks when I'm out of town where we can watch some of those things. Um, so for those of you who only join us on YouTube, those cannot be live streamed um, like a premiere. They, they can't go out right at 7 o'clock on our channel. We can't put those on our channel for copyright reasons. So I'm sending a link to all of our people, to all of our people on the live stream list. If you want that notification... Uh, let me know. Send me an email. Send me a text, and I'd be glad to add you to that so you don't miss out on the next three weeks. But we'll get back to this uh, in about a month. We'll get back to uh, Exodus chapter 4. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, comments on tonight's class, get in touch. If there's a way we can help, something we need to be praying about, uh, reach out to us. That contact information on your screen. Uh, and if you're joining us on the phone, obviously you can't see the screen. Give me a call or send a text to 608 Two two four zero two seven four. We would really love to hear from you. Uh, as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, the God of Moses, we understand tonight more than ever that you are in fact a God who sees. You see when we struggle, you see when we suffer, and you see absolutely everything. You see when we sin, you see when we do well. Father, we ask for your continued grace and your mercy over us. We pray for your help. And we pray that you would deliver us from sin and temptation, just as you delivered your people from the land of Egypt. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, who saved us from our sins. We come to you in his name. Amen.